Hey, welcome, welcome. Well, let's start off, first of all, I want to welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Glenn Brooks. And among other things, I, I design, I own the Vibrant Living Network and I design shows. And some people call me the man that gets paid to go on vacation. Even though I've worked in the Mercedes Benz community, I was a travel journalist. I just deeply have loved sobs. And I was just thinking, I think it was 1977 was my first sob. A friend of mine would pick up produce from Long Island and that sob. And I, I guess you could say with all my friends are involved with fibers and uh, uh, Camaros, I just thought sob was something else. So I'm really happy about the retro. Chris Rizon is our master sob mechanic in residence from Vermont. Many people go to see so uh, Chris from all over. He's been a master sob mechanic. He's an amazing, I think he's a great human being. He knows sobs. He's willing to say, hey, Chris, have you, have you worked on these retro sobs, the 99 and that vintage? Uh, yeah, not, not, not lately. There's not a lot of them left around here, but uh, I do own actually a, a 1978, 99. Do you know? No. What would you say about the? What would you say, Chris? Why don't we? What would you say about the '99? I I would like to get familiar with it. I haven't been in one. And what would you say about the '99? As someone who's worked on many many, you know, years and types of subs, what's your comment in modern in, in modern day in terms of quality? In terms of uh, what would you say about the '99 today? Well, I mean, you know, it's an old car, but uh, you know, it was it was a pretty neat car, you know, for its time. Um, it uh, it's basically. Um, uh, like the like the uh, the classic 900, uh, and ba basically the 900 was based off the 99. Um, it's a little bit lighter, um, doesn't have as many features, um, but they're fun cars to drive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What would you say about a 99? Yeah, Vernon. What, how do you feel about the 99? Yeah. Well, go ahead, love, of course, I love the 99 Turbo. I'd love to own one. Mm. Mm. By the way, Vernon, what part of the you, what you from? I'm sorry, are you from Virginia or no? No, no, I'm from Arkansas. Okay, what's the situation? Chris was saying he doesn't see. Are you do you have some mint, uh, uh, very good condition, or do you? Is that one of these you do? Do you restore these cars or no? Do you restore the older cars? Oh yeah, I restore oh, you quite know. a few of them. Oh, yes. and do you make them if, available to people? Somebody, to, somebody you, was talking yes. about a Mercedes, and mm -hmm. I have. A 190D Mercedes that I've also restored for a doctor here in Fort Smith. But uh, oh, wow. I don't know. Can you, can you see any of these cars? Yeah, we see them. Okay. Thank you, Troop. Jim's yeah. right here. Tell everybody. Okay. Like well, of course, I've so got the, the Sonnet, the, the Monte Carlo, 65 Monte Carlo, 64 yes. GT. Yeah. And, uh, so the people, the people, the people order the cars from you. Like, could people call and tell you they want a Sonnet and you'll or a ninety nine and you'll find it restored? Is, like, tell me about well, your service. I, I'm very interested. Actually, I've done that in the past. Uh, David mm -hmm. Winstead, uh, I restored a uh, a nineteen sixty four GT, a nineteen sixty five Monte Carlo, and a nineteen fifty eight ninety three GT seven fifty. Of course, Wayne Torini. Brought, bought all three of those, and um, um, he um, sold, uh, basically sold them to Wayne, Wayne Carini. Uh, the GT mm -hmm. 750 is in Germany. Uh, the uh, fellow in Colorado, Jerry Danner, bought the GT 850, and also bought the uh, Monte Carlo, 65 Monte Carlo, who he sold to a fellow in uh, in England. So let, let me start, let me smoke, let me smoke this shop up for a mo moment. Okay, is it, and do we have Greg, you're, you're a, well, well, Greg Hacker, welcome, welcome to the call of Master Saab Mechanic. You're, I know you've been working on Saab, have you worked in this vintage and welcome, have you worked on this vintage of old, the older Saabs like the 99 or the Sonnet or have you checked them out or researched them any? Any uh, comments, by the way, about about what? You, also, what got you into Saab? Uh, What's that? Uh, thank you. Well, the, the answer to your last question it was actually my wife. Um, actually, I started out working on Mercedes and uh, uh, wasn't really thrilled with those. And uh, so my wife goes, "Well, you know what? I always love Saabs. Why don't you go try out Saabs?" So this is, you know, almost thirty yeah. years ago. And so you know, that's how that started. Um, just like uh, Brad um, said, uh, you know, it all depends on definition definition of vintage or a relic mm -hmm. or whatever yeah. but yeah when yes. i yeah. i, I kind of came at the time where the mentor that i learned from 
uh, was about around, you know, in the mid nineties. Um, so when I started out, uh, the 900s were actually pretty much trickling out, but, um, you know, I learned from the, the shop foreman there who's now retired, you know, a lot about the old 900s and stuff like that. We yeah. never saw 99s, you know, at the dealer. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. It was mostly 900, a lot of 9,000s. Um, and we did, I did a lot of work on 900s, but yeah, so that's, that's my forte is probably back to that era. Um, yeah. I do own, I do have um, over 10 sonnets, you know, that non, non running, you know. Um, oh, really? Mm -hmm. you, you have 10 sonnets? Well, I'm not bragging, believe me. <laughs> they're <laughs> mo like most of them. They're, 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 there's a, I got one or two made with good uh, frames. Uh, the rest of them are pretty much parts cars. Um, okay. Either I found locally that people were going to uh, just scrap or get, you know, give away. And, oh, um, sure. uh, but yeah, that's, um, and I do have, um, you know, five door 99. Um, okay. And uh, that I picked up. Um, and then I got some. Um, I got a 72 99E, and I actually have a 77 uh, GL. Oh, yeah. yeah, I used to have a 72 99E. That was a running son of a gun, man. That thing ran so good. It's a fast car. Yeah, I never, I still haven't driven them yet. They're still, I mean, I just, I got them, but it's getting time to get them fixed up and worked on because, you know, I still run, I run my own repair shop. So I have to take care of customers' cars first. And of course, you know, my cars come last. So, um, yeah. so anyway, that's, that, that's my background. And, you know, you know, that Saab, you know, I went through the Saab University program. That's when they had it back in the 90s as a teacher well, called cool. Walt that, that's um, cool. That down in Atlanta, Georgia. So I went to Atlanta a few times. I went to Maryland a few times. Yeah. I went to Chicago a couple of times for training. So anyway, that, that's, you know, I, when I left the dealer, it, the sports just came in. So I took all the classes for the sports. And um, then after that, it's just been, you know, the, the I didn't see the last ones, you know, like the, the 2011s, the 95s, the new platform. Um, yeah. I get a few of those in, but not a whole lot. Yeah. The yeah, new like that I'd I like have... to hear from uh... – I'd like to hear from Brad. Can you tell me where you focus your your um, work and experience? I, I'm not sure if you go as far forward as a Saab 99 or or how you feel about the 99 or, or you're more focused on further back. I, I'm more focused on further back, yes. 99s are modern to me. Yeah, right on. And problematic unless you're, you're going to get yourself a manual transmission. Do not buy an automatic. And don't buy it with the early Triumph engine and uh, preferably buy yourself a turbo and uh, 78 turbo and just don't look back if you want something that period of time. You're starting to get into the fuel injection uh, system so you have a little more uh, niceties for individuals who maybe want to step back from a 900. Uh, 99s, I've tripped over them over the years and turned them down and I've had turbos galore. But my passions for V4s and two strokes, I'm very much into those. They're much rarer and des more desirable from a standpoint. The circles that I have found of individuals that dabble in mm -hmm. the 99, but they love 900s. And many of them don't hang out with each other at the conventions. They have their own <laughs> little circles. And many of them say, well, what's vintage? Now, they think vintage might be a 1981 900. Well, the, the terminology, I have even heard retro before. So to give you an idea, I had no clue, as I mentioned earlier, what in the world you were talking about. So I'm uh, 53 years old and I've been doing sobs for about 32 years now. And I started, saw one as a boy, a sob sonnet, a orange 70, three seventy four Saab Sonnet and I just admired it when I got into college I was given one and I haven't looked back since so I am strictly vintage vintage back yes I have a 73 I have an orange 73 Saab Sonnet in the, in the driveway um it was you know it was it was, it was uh it was a find in uh in a garage across the bay from me and uh uh, they, they, it wasn't running, but um, it was, it was $985 and a friend of mine went over and we got it running well enough to drive it across the bridge back home. And, uh, it's been, <laughs> it's been I, I a totally I reliable, owned, you know, I counted it's, it's up. fantastic. 
the, the number of sonnets that I've owned, B4s, two-stroke sonnets, and sonnet three, threes that I have had, whether it be complete, parts, done, original, uh, I've had over 60 of them. So wow. my wow. email is sonnetv4. I've torn them apart. I've stripped them. I've, I've got a warehouse of 8,000 square feet stored with parts galore for vintage <laughs> only, you know? And that's, I've had that's more amazing. sonnets than you ever could imagine. You know, I think there's a couple individuals that have uh, fields like down North Carolina that has a mess of sonnets. Well, I would be like that if I had the land, but I stripped mm -hmm. them, saved them, drove them every day as daily drivers, every day, up until four years ago. What happened? Um, I, I went and I got a truck so I could bring more sobs home, like a home for wayward sobs. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought a modern truck. Yeah, so. sounds a bit like Greg. He's been tracking. Uh, uh, he's been uh, running around the country in the last two months. Uh, I think he went to <laughs> Colorado to get a, a cache of parts. And I went to the Northeast to get a Sonnet, and I heard you got a GT, or we're looking for one. Yeah, possibly. Then not yet, but hopefully. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I went to yeah the guy out in Colorado. He was the one that um, his family died. Or, or his the the guy died I guess in a, at a car accident. He was a young guy, like in his fifties, and you know a bunch of people went down there and got him. I know Mal High went down and and picked up, up a bunch of parts and stuff like that. And the only reason why one reason why I went out there is is like somebody said um, uh, there was a ninety nine turbo uh, engine out there. And I was like you know what? I've never been to Colorado, um, so you know I can at least make a family trip out of it. So yeah, I took a twenty four foot trailer out there and I just threw in everything um that i could find um you know i could haul and uh but still tons of parts um got thrown away but i think most of them were probably stuff that you know maybe nobody would have used but you know i got a bunch of 99 headlight buckets um so i helped out a guy over in europe uh, i shipped all those over there to europe and you know some guys were looking for some tonneau covers for 900 so you know because there's always tons of those laying around so i shipped a, one of those over to europe and uh so anyway um uh, so yeah, I got, I still got tons of parts, but you know, there's, I'm hoping to get rid of some of them this year, but you know, if not, I got a semi, I bought, I bought a 53 foot semi trailer. So I got it packed full of old sob stuff now. Great. What, what, can we get into what, some, see if there's questions? Yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, please. Let's open up the questions. What are your questions about the retro or, or what were you, any, oh, any questions about the older sobs? We'd love to yeah, hear so, from you. So Glenn, Brad brings up a point. I don't, I don't hear it very often in the community either that people don't really refer to the old sobs as retro. They, they call them vintage. I'm going to go right to vintage sobs. Vintage right sobs. There, yeah. now I'm with you. I understand vintage. That's Thank not you. 900 either. That's basically two, two digits and back. Okay. Yeah. That's I'm in an yeah, educational that's, that's curve. I'm an educa educational curve. Thank you, Scott. Anybody have a question? Yes, yeah, Tim Wells here. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I'm doing Tim. a uh, uh, restoration ahead, on a 85 SPG, and I have the uh, it's uh, the plug that fits into the driver's side. Uh, it's the turn signal. It's sort of a rectangular. Uh, plug and that is broken and I've got a bunch of other harnesses from like 80 oh, probably 87 to 89 93 and all, they all use a different plug so I was wondering if anybody has the uh, one of those uh, pigtails laying around for an 85 it's a little more modern than a vintage but I don't know does anybody have that answer for that yeah, I think I might have one. Uh, right, if you want to PM me, um, you know, I'll check my stock, but I think I have some cutoff ends if nobody else has one. Is this Glenn? This is Greg Hacker. Oh, Greg. Hey, Greg. Yep, so, yeah, I think I have, I have to check my stock, but I know I got tons of turn signals, and I think a couple of them actually have the um, uh, connectors uh, still on them or somebody had cut them off from the car. Um, so, yeah, if you want to send me a message, um, so I can get your information and then I'll go through my, um, my stuff and see if I can find it. Thanks, Greg. Matthew, Thanks, Greg. Yep. Thanks, Greg. Matthew, do you have a question? I do. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's a question. It's sort of general question for anybody with, uh, any kind of technical knowledge. I've got a 1971, uh, V4 
uh, start uh, 96 before. Um, I fully restored it. I've, I've had the wiring loom patterned by a, a specialist company that sort of repatterns them from the originals. But I've got the weirdest niggle that I cannot find, and I've, I've chased everything, and I'm, I'm going to have to have another go at it, um, that when the battery with the key out and removed, the alternator charge light is on. And then when I turn the key, it goes out. And it's just it's sort of like, you know, completely the wrong way around. And it, it's then a constant drain on the battery. So I have to sort of isolate the battery every time I take it to a show or even if we go out, out and about. So, and I've chased it and chased it and chased it. And I can't see that there's anything wrong with the wiring. You know, the, the plugs are all in the right places, but would anybody have any insights as to why yeah. it would be that way around? <laughs> I just want to chime in. I have the same problem on my Sonnet. I have to, uh, I have to leave the, the, the uh, I take the negative cable off the battery, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, oh, after wow. I'm driving it. Otherwise, I'll, I, the battery will discharge completely. I'm glad I'm not mm. alone then, Scott, but uh, yeah. it's, it's a frustrating uh, irritation. And I've, you know, I've had, I've had everything done. I, like the alternator was re, uh, uh, refurbished. Um, is mm -hmm. correct from, from what I can see. So I'd be intrigued to know if anybody's got any insights as to what I could chase on this. So anybody? Anybody with a, any feedback? Electrical is always problematic. Just just literally uh, 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 trying to find somewhere along the line there's a short. And um, you definitely uh, have a short, right, Vernon? Yes, there's definitely a short, and it's you got power going to it when it shouldn't be power to it. So remember that. And you also have it may, yep. and it may very well be in the ignition switch itself. There's a possibility of that, but um, yeah, yes. On the back of that, you've got that special unit there uh, in the the key switch itself. There's it's a replacement part to, for the connections in the back. Right. Uh, and you also sometimes where the ground is is not uh, fixed the way that you think it is. And the other problem I do with like alternators, I know that they have an issue about the um, charge on them if they've been um, discharged or something. When it comes to those, you'll see the light kind of want to stay on at times and they, they have to be, uh, um, oh, Al, what would you say that would be to, to charge up the alternator you have with the, with the voltage regulator? And they have a problem with not charging up properly and discharging on you. And it, it um, you definitely got a wire that's crossed someplace, in my opinion. Yes, I had the same thing on a on a ninety six, a seventy two, and yeah. <laughs> it was a it was a uh, bad ground. I had a son that did it, and I had two wires that were uh, touching, um, and had where you know you want to look and see where you got your live wires going. You know? Okay, thank you. I have a question. I have uh, something to add to that too. Good. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. But <clears throat> whenever I diagnose a, um, a, a battery draw, uh, especially on any kind of car, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, uh, a 1960 to, to, you know, 2011, whatever. Um, it's, it's all about um, isolating the system. So if you got a draw, um, you know, like I have a um, old uh, Vantage Pro, uh, from snap on and it has a you know voltage uh um you just clamp it around the uh battery and you can see how amperage is being drawn through the system so the best way i find out to you know find uh draws is to isolate each system so usually the easiest thing to do is go to the fuse panel and you watch your meter you know when your, your voltage your amperage is being drawn so um i think spec is something like um i don't know like 20 milliamps or something like that so you start pulling fuses and if, if the voltage, you know, drops down, well, you know, at least you can pull the wiring diagram and see what's on that fuse. And that's how you kind of, it helps narrow down and isolate where exactly your draw is coming from, you know, especially on the alternator light, you know, that light, um, you know, it, uh, it, I would look at the wiring diagram uh, of the old sonnets, you know, which I'm sure somebody, well, there's probably, I've done it all over Facebook. And you can kind of help isolate that circuit. But, you know, Brad's correct that, you know, the light's coming on, it's getting grounded for somehow the power. So, um, you know, something's going on with that. So, I, you know, as far as how to isolate that, I've, you know, I've never heard of that before. So that's kind of a new one to me. But there is a diode, I think Brad just said too, there's a diode inside the alternator. If that diode goes bad, 
in the alternator, I mean, that's possible. That could be your problem too. I'm not saying that's your problem, but that is a probability. Okay, thank, thank you. you. A lot of shops are trying to rebuild these Bosch units and uh, they are starting to have problems getting parts I've seen in my area of getting parts for them. It was shared, however, with a Mercedes and you, there's a like a 65 or a 75 amp Mercedes that was very similar uh, in size, uh, except it was higher amperage and it was a Bosch and it was a mid seventies Mercedes, but it had a three prong connector that were uh, uh, like mail ends on, on the uh, back side. So you'd have to use a, a coupler like, uh, but it was, a, it bolts right on to a sonnet and I've used them before too, but it's out of a Mercedes. But okay, thank you guys. No, you're welcome. Uh, Good luck. Remember, sonnets yeah, don't you. ground thank well. You. Remember that sonnets do not ground well with that fiberglass body. Yeah, yeah, mm. that's the mm. problem. Mm. Chris, Chris Rizan, Master Saw Mechanic. Uh, do you yeah. do you feel the the vintage sobs have like what your you know when, when we used to work really close with Walter Wong at the Right Solution. Chris told me, I'm sorry, um, Walter told us, if he had to build a platform, he, he, his choice was to build it for a 9,000. He thought that was the finest sob. What about you, Chris? You, over the last 30 years, is there anything in the vintage line that you always felt like, why didn't they reproduce it? Or what's your take from working the last, I guess, <laughs> the last 35 years? What, what, any comment about uh, something in the, in the line that you really felt you were surprised they didn't reproduce or you saw the genius of how why they reproduced it any comments about quality or innovation well uh big thing for me is i don't know why they got rid of the hatchback right. that, that seemed to be real popular yeah um you know not you know nine thousand was you know that was great that was a great car with a hatchback i mean they made a four-door but that wasn't extremely popular no. Uh, and you know the 900s had the hatchback, um, and uh, you know then when they came out with the newer ones, they did away with the hatchback. Um, that's that's one thing. Uh, yeah, the 9000s, uh, they were they were a great car. Um, uh, yeah, I like the 900s too. I like the 99s. Didn't never did much with the earlier cars. Uh, okay. I, I worked on a, a few uh, like V4s. I owned a Sonnet for a while. Somebody actually gave mm -hmm. it to me, um, okay. but the uh, the floor pan, you know, rusted out on it, and I ended up selling it to somebody who was going to restore it. Um, I own um, a 1978 99 Turbo right now. Wow! I've owned since yeah, since the mm -hmm. 80s. I've owned that. Car. Is that is that is That's that a great exciting. driving car? What's that? Oh, go ahead and repeat. I'm sorry. Speak, say that again. He said that's exciting. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, a, it's a neat car. Yeah. It's yeah. an exciting um, car. Yeah. I, I mean, would like was, to own you know, one of those. What's that? I'd like to own one of those. Yeah. I mean, I've owned it. I owned it. Uh, uh, somebody, I bought it when I was working at the dealership. Uh, somebody had. Um, Actually, they uh, they ran it out of oil. I ended up having to put another engine in it. Wow. Um, yeah, they uh, they hit something and took out the uh, oil cooler. And at the time, you know, the car, you know, a lot of people wanted the 900. So, you know, nobody really, I mean, there was people who wanted it, but nobody really wanted to put any money into it. So I just, wow. I ended up yeah. buying it cheap and I've had it ever since. Um, I don't drive it that often anymore, but uh but when I do, I always think, gee, it's it's a it's it's a neat car to drive. And I'm, you know, it sure is. I, yeah, that's yeah, that's an exciting yeah. car. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But you know, Mark Adams. I'm sorry. Bud Clark worked at a dealership up, I think, it was in New Hampshire, and so when when the uh, GT 850s came out, of course, everybody uh, a fellow uh, uh, brought in a, a, a GT 750, and he had to he had to have that GT 850. So he traded in, and when he traded in his, his uh, GT750, uh, for uh, Bud, Bud bought it, bought the GT750, and uh, you know the, the big uh, the 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 big change was the dual uh, com, uh, expansion chamber when the uh, when the GT850s came out with a dual 
expansion chamber that really allowed that engine to really breathe a lot better than on the uh, on the on the uh, on the GT750. And of course, uh, a lot of people um, uh, put the dual expansion chamber on the GT750 and really made a difference in not only the performance but the longevity of the engine itself. As long as you can make them breathe, that's that's the whole key, you know, is uh, open open up the exhaust on them and um, and make sure the exhaust is not is not stopped up or the expansion chamber. They're doing making really incredible expansion chambers now. Actually, I've got three of them. Can anybody see those? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Scott, okay. Scott, you see it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as um, opposed to, but according to uh, to Tom Donnie, who uh, run, runs it on the dyno, that basically they're they're really not any better uh, than the original. You know, Saab had everything really pretty well worked out. It was an incredible, intelligent people, yeah, in the uh, technicians work, working these two strokes, and and they worked hard getting everything everything uh, the way it should be. And, but it just has a great, they, they have a great sound to them. And I think they breathe better. Let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, from the vintage perspective and your experience just with cars, I guess this is an open question. Did you find that Saab just clearly was so distinct that they did think of it more like a jet? Or in other words, was the innovation so different than other vehicles at the time? I remember, I don't know what ad this this uh, what year this ad ran, but it was an ad where they took a, a a crane and it was a they had a BMW and a Saab, and they dropped the BMW off the crane for 20 feet and crashed down. And it pancaked, and the Saab bounced back, and it said in the ad like you know what it say something like who's you know where's the ultimate driving car now? Did Saab always strike you? From the early days of it being, you know, from the vintage till now, is being just a really different mentality. A real, the whole way they went about it was totally different than anything in the marketplace. It seemed to me the people I was around that were, were into Saab, like Dave Connor just retired, and I think he'd been working on Saabs for I don't know 50 years, and he had a lot. He had a ton of Saabs in his backyard, and for him, he worked seven days a week, and it was he. He was another person. It was like going to church, the church of Saab, and people would go there with their older cars. Did, did it seem from the get-go that these cars are different on the, from their mentality to the innovation than anything you guys had seen? I think so. I, I yeah. think they're just so beautifully designed. I think uh, every, every part of them, uh, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about the Swedes is that they, uh, uh, they solve problems in a very beautiful, logical way. They don't need a whole lot of gadgets. It's just, uh, mm -hmm. it's just a very, uh, 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 way of thinking to resolve issues such as the blind on the uh, on the uh, radiator. I mean, look at that. Look at this. Allow, allows it to heat up quicker, and and you may you you control it on the inside of of the uh, of the of the driver's seat. Just it's just an exciting way of resolving issues that that uh, that the Swedes uh, Swedish technology yeah no I, I I don't know as I said earlier I said when I was growing up there were firebirds and Camaros but when I was sure. I guess I was in a, a 99 I just loved the 99 by the way uh, Chris mentioned the hatchback the hatchback was amazing he used to be able to fill the hatchback with crates and crates of vegetables. It was, he would pick stuff up oh, for yeah. a co-op, this friend of mine, right? So yeah. I just didn't see anything like that in the American cars. Right. And I just loved the. By the way, was from the, from you guys that are uh, vintage experts, was, was Saab always notorious for being, the, for, in, you know, unusually safe? Was that early on, the distinction well, about safety? One. Absolutely. Without a doubt, the safest, the safest car. Mm. I mean, Kyle, unbelievable. You have your, your head, you have your hand raised. Do you, do you have a question? Uh, me, Paul? Yes. 
All right, now I just wanted to make an uh, introduction to myself. Uh, Paul Bates Good from man. Pittsburgh. Uh, hello, Al. I see you there. Welcome. I have to change uh, emails with you. And uh, I have a 66 Monte Carlo. And uh, oh, nice. It's, it's very, very good. Wow. And, uh, I was That's going cool. to, just going to comment about the Swedish engineering being Please. somewhat isolated with their, in their own territory without being cross pollinated with the British or the uh, German yeah. engineers so much. They came up with their own solutions. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, I I totally agree with that. It, yeah, they didn't look at they didn't look at anyone else. They basically resolved the issue on their own, without basically plagiarizing. Right. I'd like to know more about the '66 Monte Carlo. <laughs> I would. What, okay. what color? It's white, red interior, yeah. new, uh, new Tom Donny uh, crankshaft and pistons. It rocks. It, it's, it's a it's cool stupid. car. Yeah, solid I've, body. I've, I've got a, I've got a '65 right here. I call it the Atomic Saw. <laughs> Picked it up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, from. Uh, uh, what was what was his name? Ken Van Riper. Ken Van Riper in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Does anybody know him? New Ken? Yeah, I know Ken. Yeah, mm. great guy. Yeah. I have a question for you, Brad, um, and and maybe also for Vernon. Um, <clears throat> it's about the marketplace today for vintage sobs. Um, you know, how, how do you feel that those sobs are being valued in 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 the broader you know marketplace? And uh, how do you think the future values are, are going to be? And, and what's, uh, you know, how hard is it now to get, um, you know, if you wanted a Sonnet or if you wanted a 99 or, or a 96, how, how hard is it to get a, a decent one these days? Well, I've, I've seen the market go up, that's for sure, because other cars have gone up and they've gone with them. But there were many years that they were, of course, a vintage. I mean, it was a, such a small community. But recently, you'll see a couple different sales. I mean, one's 15 years ago when it was a, a wagon. It went for 40000 And recently, you had another 62 that just went for $20,600 online, and it still had like a number two cylinder bad. You know, but one or two cars at, at a time does not a market make. But on average, the prices have definitely gone up more on the rarer, cars just like with collectible coins and comics there are ones that were rare back when they were new and desirable and they have retained their value and most of them are all bought and sold secretly you know huh. you, you don't see you don't pick up a hemmings and go find a gt 850 or heaven forbid a 750 in the hemmings magazine you know you gotta idea. know where to look they're much rarer than any 900s out there and the market has gone up on vintage because of one, you have Europeans. I've sold many to Europe. I have since stopped doing that. And at one time I had seven stroker sonnets. Okay, I'm down to three now. But the fact is that the market has become more aware by people who, who did buy Porsches that bought Volvos hmm. and are looking huh. for sobs. So the market, um, the pool of people has definitely increased with some of the awareness for, for vintage sobs. And that was a question you asked for me. Was there something else? Well, I, I'll just comment. <clears throat> I noticed, uh, you know, uh, the Europeans, po you know, they're, they're in there poaching off um, West, All the Coast time. Con West Coast convertibles are very popular. I go over to uh, Norway and other parts of, of Europe. Um, what, I just wonder, are you trying to keep the, the sobs here in the U.S.? I mm. am. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. There's too mm. many, too many that's gone to Europe and people don't know it. I have a 61 GT 750 and I have a 58 GT 750 and several GT 850s, but they, there used to be a few. I know of one other gentleman with a, with a 61 and I know Tom Donnie brought one from Europe. That's three three 
There was another one that had a floor rusted out that I knew about in Pennsylvania. That's a GT 96 body style GT 750. So it's good for awareness to people to realize that these cars initially in the 50s and 60s were built the same quality as a Porsche 356 and 911. Mm -hmm. And they had some components that actually were shared, including a wooden steering wheel, Nardi wooden steering wheel. And the seats were more comfortable in a Saab GT than they were in a Porsche. Mm -hmm. So the awareness of the quality has not been diminished in Europe. It has always been there. And they're aware of it. And many of them were sold here. So they have been fighting since the late 80s to grab them and bring them back. Um, and over here, people just sold them blindly and way they went. Well, I believe that there are three, maybe four of the 61 GTs. Now you could take every single rare 900. To, I could have bought three 78 turbos at one time. The rarity is such that people do not, unless they're in vintage, understand. They just do not understand the rarity of what's left today. You know, Al, Al Smith is on with us. Al is working on a very rare car. You know, he has a 67 Monte Carlo V4. And I, I'm aware of maybe four in the country. Al, isn't that about correct? Um, that's from what I understand. Yeah, with the, uh, the registry. Hi, hi, Paul. Nice to meet you finally. Your car is in the registry as of today. All right, good. All right. Um, <laughs> very yeah, rare. there aren't a lot of those V4 Monte Carlos around. Uh, uh, Bruce Harbison out in, um, where is he, in Oregon or Washington or something? He has one that he's restoring right now. I believe there's uh, one in Colorado that has a sun Colorado, roof. that's right, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, you understand it's a small community and we know where they are. I have touched upon them. I won a quick example. You know, a car, they said, well, it's sitting in a barn over the middle of Timbuktu. And they told me about it. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> Tell me more. And they're describing it. And I said, oh, I, that's not there anymore. How do you know? It's been there for 30 years. And I said, well, it's in my garage right now. I mean, uh, uh, the Dave Winstead called me to get an idea what the value of his cars were prior to him selling. He, he said, I got two people to call and you're one of them for the ones that Vernon did a good job on restoring for him. Yeah. You know, he said, what do you think they're worth? I got a guy with deep pockets and wants to buy them. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a different community. When you go to the Saab conventions as well, why they've been diminishing with vintages, it's just a different world. Uh, when you buy a 911 today and someone has a 356, uh, they're a little more appreciative and understanding of the heritage. And I think a lot of that's been lost, if you ask my opinion, from the community as a whole, two different factions. You know, the idea that we're vintage, well, we have, we've been always vintage, but it's not really known by 900 and newer people. You know, um, anything that General Motors has, like he asked, is there any particular model that might be special or I wish they kept? Yes. Um, yeah. I, I'll speak to that for a minute, is that all of them, you know, they're all were unique. It was a different time, but we didn't have a, I mean, I go to the conventions, I get headaches from trying to judge <laughs> nine, three X, X, Y with a, a convertible. They got umpteen categories, folks. Okay. Oh, that, mm -hmm. well, that's different. That's a 900 SPG. That's a big, well, that's an SPG without this. And that's, I said, folks, they all look the same and they have no <laughs> clue about vintage. And we need to be able to have a better understanding of the heritage. All your cars came from the heritage, just like Porsche, VW, Ferrari. They have a better understanding and appreciation for vintage. So these opportunities are very good for people to learn. Again, we're talking about one of three cars just from that. I believe the, uh, there's maybe two other 58 GT 750s left in the country. Folks, we're talking three cars. How many SPGs are there? there there's umpteen of them. It's a different world. You understand, Scott? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I hear you. I, I think, you know, part of that is, uh, you know, when you compare Saab and Porsche or Ferrari, uh, you know, I would have to say, the only thing I'd have to say is there's more accessibility to those cars than there are to vintage Saabs. I mean, it's, it's just 
part of the problem is, you know, um, what I've been saying lately uh, uh, is I, I'm encouraged with young owners of mostly Saab 900 or, or some of the, you know, some of the early Saab 93s. I've been encouraged that young people are still interested in Saabs of some sort or another, but they don't have an opportunity, just like you mentioned, because of accessibility to be exposed to vintage Saabs and appreciate them. And uh, I, I think if there were more of them available, that maybe that would be a little bit better. But yeah, I, I agree with you nonetheless, because it's now, just not We have the vintage Saab Jamboree that Al's been to. Um, we've had the largest collection of vintage Saabs, our fifth year this year is going to be in June. Okay. And we had, I think the maximum has been 55 vintage Saabs that we have not seen since Waterville Valley in 1997, any one place. We had 13 vintage wagons alone two years ago. Nice. And uh, we have tech sessions. It's a free event near Scranton, Pennsylvania. And uh, it's all focused on two digits and back. Do you like my shop? Yeah. Yeah. It's I think uh, vintage Saab will, uh, will just continue to get to go up in price without a doubt. So uh, I'll get the math. Matthew, you have another question? Uh, you're, you're, you're muted. There you go. It was more, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah. Um, it was more just a, a further embellishment about the, uh, the values of these that uh, I don't know if anybody follows Bring a Trailer, uh, the website. There was a, a 95 on there recently that sold for 31,000 US. Mm. Um, and it mm. wasn't, it was a, it was in fine condition, but uh, it wasn't like fully restored or anything like that. It had sort of patina and sort of knocks and stone chips and all the rest of it. Um, I was kind of floored by what it went for in the end. And anytime I see a SARP on there, I do sort of follow it with some interest. Um, and the other one that was on there recently was a, a brand new set of the sort of the mini light wheels, the five spoke, uh, 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 sorry, the five uh, hold mini light wheels for, for uh, again, 96, 95 Sonics. And they went for $5,000 um, just for the wheels. So, you know, to sort of further embellish what uh, Brad was saying, like, yeah, they, they, I, I feel the values are going up. Um, and Brad, to your point, I, I I went the other way. I dragged one over to this side of the pond, so from Europe. So <laughs> what was that? William, I, 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 dra I dragged my car from the UK over here. So we've got one extra one that's come this way <laughs> instead of the other Thank you. Way. Thank you. Excellent. Thank oh, you. Thank where you. are you located? <laughs> I'm in Canada, so uh, I'm about an hour outside of Toronto. So so just as mm. another point, uh, another data point, uh, a, a 68. Uh, 995 wagon was listed um, just the other day on Sabnet. It, it doesn't look to be in great shape. I mean, there's no glass. It's uh, no glass. The glass is missing in the car. It was only 750, but it sold in less than 24 hours. Someone scooped up that body real, real fast. Well, 68 is a real good year. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's I've got a question. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. I've got. Um, uh, 1966 Monte Carlo um, 850 as well that I'm uh, restoring. I've owned it for some years, hadn't run for a long time. And I've got it running now. And, um, you know, it's, it's um, at times uh, you have trouble finding out about it. But I also have, and I have a question, I have a uh, 1971 um, uh, 95, the station wagon. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but this particular model, you have to have the uh, shift lever in reverse before you can turn the key all the way off. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it locks over there so that you can't mm -hmm. then uh, turn it again. There's, there's ways in, in one of my manuals that says that you can get that out by drilling out the, um, you know, the, the cylinder there. But I wondered if there's some, easier way that or people have run into that the other sobs i've owned because i've had some 96s didn't have that issue where you had to have it in reverse to turn the key all the way off what have you got right now the key is in the ignition key said? is in key is in the ignition in fact I, I, this 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 runs i'm not running it i live in maine so i don't run these guys in the winter 
but uh, the the 95 runs now, um, and I've it registered. It it needs the body is fine because it came from California at one point, but um, needs to be painted and, and so on. So I can I can start it up and run it, but I just make sure I never turn that key off uh, when <laughs> when I'm in reverse because. <laughs> it started doing this a couple of years ago that would just then not turn on again. I mean, you couldn't, you, and the way I, the one it did it on me, I put a lot of pressure on the shifting lever, trying to overpower it, finally got it to release and I've not put it in reverse again and turned the key off. So it, it, it's not going in reverse, you're saying? It, it'll go in, it, yeah, it, it drives in reverse fine. You just, yep. it won't come out of reverse if the key is all the way to the lock position. It, it, it's like a garage lock position on the uh, cylinder. Well, you don't want to drill it out, that's for sure. No, uh, I, I think don't. there's I think there's an adjustment on on the column or if you don't put the column all the way in reverse and just slightly up there is an adjustment on them and I have seen that as well I had a 72 um, 96 I mean the adjustment I just had a, a 64 did the same the same thing there's an adjustment on it they get worn if you if you um, uh, work with that a little bit then you could always email me separately if you want and I will work with you on it. Yeah, I'd, li I'd, I'd like that. I, I, um, You're going to drill it about 10 o'clock if you have to, but then you've got to have a new key cylinder and uh, you don't want to have to mess with that. I mean, no, uh, I know I don't. That, that, that's the last thing I want to do. But that key will come out. There's an adjustment up under, underneath that that uh, moves the, uh, the uh, lock mechanism, as they're called. There's like a cover over it. But I'll, I'll check my manuals because it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And sometimes if you take the column and you uh, put it up in the first and then reverse and then move the lever up a little bit or free, it's out of adjustment. So I'll take a look at the book and then you can email me if you like. Okay, thank you. Well, hey, Bill. You're listening to a sob and driving program. I'm, I'm Glenn Brooks. It's, so, it's just such a good conversation. I had an open question I wanted to ask you you vintage specialists and, and Chris and uh, Greg and uh, Todd, Vernon, Scott. I, I, was, I met with Lucas, Lucas Parts at Auto Parts and uh, they told me they feel part of their marketplace is, is these older hot burning engines. Any comments about engine additives in the, in the older engines? Because I've read that it, some people say I stay away from I mean, Anybody's experience or comments about Lucas, because I was curious about that company as, as per my, my Saab mechanic as an example, always recommended Lucas products. It wasn't Scott, uh, it wasn't Chris, but this other guy in, in New York, any comments about the value in, in higher mileage engines that are turbos is any, anything that you guys found that to be useful or stay away from them. Any comments about additives as it relates to the, uh, to the vintage cars. My vintage cars don't have turbos, so someone else else will have to help help with them. That when did when did the turbo? Okay, then that's my ignorance. When did the when did turbo start? What year? Seventy eight, ninety nine. Seventy eight. Okay. Yeah, that's modern. So modern. Wow, so I must. I'm still learning. This is such an educational format for me today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look under the hood of a seventy eight turbo, and then look under the hood of a seventy four Sonnet, and you'll see the world of difference. You know? Wow. Well, those the Sonnet, was that a very fast driving car? What made the Sonnet one of a kind? What made the Sonnet a Saab? It's light. It handles incredibly well. It, mm -hmm. uh, it's aerodynamic. It, um, <laughs> it's just a, 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 a absolutely thrill to drive. It, it, uh, it just handles and drives so much different than a 96. And it that's does. why I, that's right. I own a couple of them. And mm -hmm. there are times I wake up in the morning time and I go, okay, well, I want to, I want to drive my GT, my 96 GT. And I go, well, yeah, that's yeah. really, really fun. And I go, you know what? Mm -hmm. I think, I think uh, I want to drive my Sonnet. And it just, it just is, it has just different sensibilities about them. 
And, uh, yeah, it's like driving go a go-kart, I say, you know? Well, to a certain <laughs> extent, yes, and they're, and they're light. And they got a V4 engine in them. And, and they sound damn good. I mean, they really <laughs> sound good. And they run great. The, the mm -hmm. big, big thing about driving a Sonnet, especially, is that, again, they do not have power steering. They just have a rack and pinion. This and is correct. And that's what going, makes them so damn great. Yeah, yeah they're know. responsive. You, just, you have to handle them. So you're going down the road and you, you decided, I'm going to turn the radio and you leave your hand on the steering wheel. <laughs> you kind of say, oh, I've got to make a left-hand turn. You don't take you don't take your hand and move the steering wheel back. It'll go where you pointed it, you know? It will, yeah. It, it's, so you are one with the car. It isn't driving you, mm -hmm. you're driving mm -hmm. it. That's the world mm -hmm. of difference between them. Right. So right. if you're looking more hard, it's like j jumping into an MGA, you know, it is... Mm -hmm. It's a more of a sports car as far as that period of time, but it's, I love sonnets. And I, every time I go to the bank and I go through and it has a reflective mirror and I look over and I say, my wife's sitting there and I look in them, I say, damn, I look good in this car. So <laughs> I've been doing that for 30 years. And I said, that's why I drive a sob sonnet. And ideally we just keep looking better each time. Yeah. That's, the whole, that's the whole idea. <laughs> Yeah, these, yeah, these, cars, these, these cars make us better humans. These cars mm -hmm. make us better human beings. I guarantee you. Yeah, it has yeah. A, it has a wonderful um, throaty sound on on a downshift, and uh, just like um, I, I don't think this is this is only this is unique to the Sonnet, but um, you know, it's fun to do the the RPM management. You know, it's it's fun to manage uh, the RPM when you drive we, that car. Let's see if we can and, start uh, one up. Yeah. It, it's a uh, it's a joy to drive. Are you talking about the additives? Uh, so you're talking about like fuel additives for like cars that yeah, are made. Yeah, thank fuel? you. Yeah, I was sure I was curious for, for you guys that are particularly you know doing the vintage. Are any fuel additives a, a I, game I changer? Use, I don't use any oil. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now for for lead additive, that Bardals has one that has this uh, chemical that's very long, but I believe it's abbreviated with MMT. And don't mm -hmm. get your traditional lead additive, but you want to buy this that has a hydrocarbon in it versus just plain oil that they add to your gas. To, mm -hmm. so you want to be careful. That's okay. a big thing yeah. people make mistakes on, and it gums up your, your fuel pump and your carburetor, and it's really oh. just oil that you're putting in there for an additive. So uh, and that's a very important thing. But no, there's none of that. I, I run okay. Redline oil for the transmission. Yeah. And... Yeah. Uh, their MT oil. I've had good luck mm -hmm. with that, and it does make an improvement, but nothing really that fancy. You know, dot three, dot four oil for the hydraulic is best because of the rubber seals. Um, yeah, there's a lot of parts interchangeable with these cars. You kind of have to know that as well. Uh, they were using a lot of British cars, the early stuff. And once you once you get into a vintage Saab, you'll just see where it, it had the character of Saab was still there. You know, it, it, it dissipated later, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, that was my next question. I was curious. Um, I'll direct this to maybe Chris and Scott, but then all the panel. I was just curious uh, right now, Chris, are you seeing young people who are just getting to solve when they come to you, they're excited or that that's rare, never, or, or sometimes what, what's it like with people, young people, the younger market, just hearing about a sob and they're just so excited. Like they, they they, they bring to you, a, let's say, a retro or a, not a retro, an old. I guess it wouldn't be considered a vintage, but let's say they bring you a an older, um, an early '90s or mid '90s, let's say 900. Are you seeing any of that? Are you seeing the younger population get turned on to to Saab now? Yeah, I mean there are, there are some people, um, young people, that uh, that do really want, you know, do. I mean a lot of them are, are would like to have a uh, a classic 900. But I did have somebody call me last summer that was looking at a uh, a two stroke over in New Hampshire. Oh, uh, you know, so I mean, there you know there are there are young people out there that that are are, are looking for these cars. Um, not a lot, but I mean, there are some. Yeah. Okay. What kind of what about, Scott? What about you, what about what about you, Scott? Any any uh, stories? Yeah, like about, I mentioned. You know, I, I, I have yeah. a lot of con. You know, I get I, I, obviously. You know, I run Sobnet and. Uh, right. Um, so I'm on the internet all day, um, in, you know, interfacing with different Saab people. 
And uh, I'm just impressed, you know, over the last couple of years and how many young people I'm having contact with who are picking up, you know, uh, older sobs and, uh, and to really love them. I, I mean, they fall in love with them. Like I fell in love with sobs when I was, mm. uh, when I was younger. And so, well, they're human friendly. Yeah. And they're fun. You, I mean, you they're can, fun. You can they look like, you know, I didn't want a car that looked like every other car. And, exactly. uh, yeah. and I like to drive. Yeah. And so I got the best, yeah. you know, uh, a unique looking car that drives, uh, that drives well and drives sporty. And that's exactly yeah. what I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I totally relate. Yes. Well, to this day, I, I, I might be one of a kind. I think the aesthetics, the looks of sobs, the vintage sobs without question, but to this day, I'm still very excited about an SPG. I mean, I see an SPG, for instance, I'm just, I just think that's an amazing car. I'm, I, I haven't familiarized myself with the Vegan, but I'm curious if I haven't owned one yet. Uh, and I, I haven't owned a, a vintage yet. So I'm really okay. curious. I, I'm, I'm curious from the, from, if I wanted a vintage car, can I order one from you guys? Is that something that I could, I could order a vintage car that you would, you would update, make sure it's in, a, you know, it's in great shape? Is that something you do? It would depend on what kind you wanted. I guess I would get your advice. What would you advise? What if I told you I wanted a car that was just going to be a fun handling car, kind of a head turner. That's going to be my summer car and my something to report on and do some journalistic, you know, reporting. What would you recommend? I told you I want a fun car to really go on the back roads of Vermont to go to Cape Cod. What's what would be a summer car that you think would just rock the, rock me? It'd be amazing. Well, you, a, a Monte Carlo or a GT or a Sonnet. Any any one of those of those three, but how tall people, are you? People do not want to get people five, do not seven. want to sell them. Okay. Okay, five seven. So you don't, you do you what's that? You care you're five foot seven. Do you do you I'm, carry a lot I'm of as tall as the average I'm as tall as the average Swedish person, yes. Okay. Do you carry a lot of stuff with you during the summer on your trips? Ten, tennis rackets, um tennis rackets, uh, just you know, I don't know. Archery, just, just I don't know, summer, summer, nothing, nothing particularly. Just, just fun with stuff. Do you take people with you? Yeah, you. That's a great question. Probably, really, it's usually my partner. It's usually me and her. Okay. And uh, do you care if you listen to a radio? The whole this. I like listening to the radio. Okay. Okay. And uh, you're not going to drive in cold weather, right? Just summer, fair weather. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I love the summer. I was yeah, I'm thinking of, let's say for let's say for a summer car, but I would be interested in the possibility of a winter car too. The '99 that I was in, I, we drove it in the winter. We picked up uh, crates of vegetables, and I I thought that car was indestructible. So I love that part of the '99. But are we calling are we calling that vintage by today by your standards or no? Is '99 yeah. considered a vintage car? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Right, so. All right. Cool. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. I would I would say that you want to take a look at uh, buying a. A 70s, a 72 uh, wagon, if you plan to carry gear, something unique. Uh, if you're going to do any kind of camping and stuff or hauling anything, if you want. A 96 is, is just as practical. It's going to be easier to get, more affordable, depending on your price range. And if you like mm -hmm. something that's more stiffer a ride and more of a driving experience versus going a grocery getter, then go with a Sonic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think so that's think do you guys think if Chris was going to, do you think the marketplace, is the marketplace there? Like if Chris was going to be working on, on vintage cars with, I'm just curious about the growing marketplace. Is there a growing marketplace for vintage subs? Oh, most, most definitely. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. A lot of what I've been doing for years is going to the local cruise ins, going to events, showing people that hadn't seen one in years. And many times you hear, boy, I haven't seen one of those in years. So awareness has definitely been increasing. And as a result, more people are saying, wow, this looks like an affordable alternative to get into a vintage car. Uh, they know mm -hmm. them for their durability, uh, excellent quality. They like uniqueness. I like to be different yes. when I go to yes. a, a car show. Uh, I used yes. to buy Mustangs, vintage Mustangs. I had lots of them, yes. I used to judge them. I, I, then I went to Porsches and I've had Pontiacs from the fifties and Buick straight eights. I've had them all old Toronados. I, I work on all mm -hmm. cars, but by okay. God, there's nothing like a Saab unless you can buy a Ferrari. Mm. Mm. 
Chris, I know you've worked on a lot of 900s, uh-huh. a lot of 900s. Lot. What would you say about, I guess that we're going to call it the next evolution or to this day, is our, I think you're seeing some 900, 9000s. Any comments about the, the quality? Do you think the quality was, the quality must have been off the chart. I think I think Click and Clock, the uh, they said that for, for, in their experience that the, the Saab 900 was was what was the most reliable, outstanding car back, let's say in the 80s. That was one of their comments. To, by today's standards, Chris, do you, still, do you think the 900 is still right there in terms of uh, quality, in terms of performance? Well, I mean, there, yeah, the quality's still there. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. obviously things have changed a lot in the last, uh, you know. 30 years uh yeah. so i mean you know but but for their time they were a great performing car a great handling car um they were built like a tank uh nice. but yeah i think they're you know they were a great car yeah and the, the, the 99s were too yeah the problem i'm seeing here is if, if one is looking at getting into any type of car now being including 900s that are 30 yes. plus years old Yes. You've got to not only look at the initial cost, but you've got to look at the maintenance on them. And yes. a vintage Saab, there's some parts that, of course, if you're not going to get a rare GT and so forth, the regular mundane, normal 96, 95, you can get parts, you can get support. And there's less to go wrong. If you look okay. underneath the hood of a mm-hmm. 86, you know, 900, okay? Yes. Look at the vacuum lines, look at all the modules, look at all of the sensors. Where are you going to buy them? You folks got to realize that stuff is drying up and you are dead in the water if you have a Mm -hmm. sensor go, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've Mm -hmm. heard more people complain about, well, this little doodad's broke on my 900. Uh, It won't start well. It's a sensor someplace. You know, I I bought a lot of Hondas too in my day from the 80s. I love yeah. Waggle bands, you know, and they had mm-hmm. carburetors. They had over sixty vacuum lines. If if it it took a professional then to work on a nine hundred, and people in, on this group here have worked on them for <laughs> years, but yeah. where do you get the parts? There are a lot to maintain. Right. It's not a mm-hmm. it's not a vintage car like a fifties, a forties, a yes. thirty. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's different. Yeah. Different. Right. All right, do we, have any, the, well, do we have any final questions? We're gonna we're gonna kind of any, wrap up. any final final questions. Round. Final questions. Uh, yeah, Tim. Anybody, anybody want to buy a two thousand three? Three point oh, midnight blue. You should wagon. list it on, you should list it on Sobnet for sale. I will. <laughs> Tim, you I highly question. recommend Sobnet. By the way, I think Sobnet's off the planet. If you're a Sob, if you're passionate about Sobs, check out Sobnet. You meet some great people, by the way. Uh, I'm, the I'm a is always cool. You're okay. I'm a well, and so, what, so is that a 900 you have or a, a, a 95 or a 93? Uh, 95, 3.0, 6-cylinder, uh, Smoking tires, men's three. Okay, is it a five speed? Five speed? No, it's a it's a okay, automatic. automatic. Okay. And it's um it's got air conditioned seats through the little perforated hole. Really? Your seats. That's blows, fun. It blows That's air fun. up your bum. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and I got a brand cool. new set of heads that'll fit that car too as backup if you ever need them. <laughs> Tim, okay, let's get to Tim. Tim, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I'd like to ask about my uh, 2007 95 Arrow wagon. It has uh, xenon headlights, and the only way I can keep those things on bright is to pull the stalk back to actuate the brights. I've got a 2009 95 with xenons as well. I've swapped out the headlight assemblies. I've swapped out the uh, stalk that actuates the uh, the brights. I've swapped out the relays. I've swapped out the headlight switch. Nothing seems to make a difference. Uh, it it uh, it works fine in my 2009, but if I put it all in my 2007, I still get the same results. So uh, I've done the relays, the fuses, all of that. Made sure the switch is on. And uh, I can't find that problem. So I wondered if there's any suggestions on that. Good question. Um, I had one with a broken wire. 
uh, doing the same thing. Uh, it was down. It was down. It was a real pain place to get to. So I ended up running another wire uh, because it was down in the harness uh, right before it went into the firewall. Um, same same exact problem. The wire it just had a little nick in it and it corroded through. I'll be there. Uh, oh. That's wow. that's where I would look. Huh. That's a good idea. Chris, why don't you why don't you give us your number and website, Chris? Just uh, Chris Rizan is our in in house uh, co host, and uh, Chris, why don't you give us your contact as well? So um, okay, so uh, phone number is eight zero two. Three two five, eight two seven. Um, my website is just uh, Rizan Saab Repair dot uh, com, um, and I'm located in uh, Dorset, Vermont. A good, a good place to drive to, by the way. Beautiful drive. Oh yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Greg and and Brad, and why don't you give us your contact? I know, I know, Scott's probably going to include it, but if you want to give out your website or uh, a contact, why not? Go ahead, please. Well, <clears throat> mine's pretty easy. It's it's uh, hackerautomotive at gmail dot com, and uh, the phone number here at the shop is um, um, well. Here, if you want to get a hold of me personally, it's it's five one three six five two three four nine seven. But but yeah, the website's easy too. Or email. Okay. Brad, any if, if you want to only if, if you want to. Oh, sonnet v4 at yahoo.com. Perfect. Thanks. That's one end, two Thank T. Thank you. One end, two <laughs> T. Thank you. Thank you. Been that way for 30 years, I think, with the emails. Any final vintage okay. job question? Mm. All right. I think Are that's we're going to do this today. again sometime. Let's say, sorry. Are we going to do this again sometime? Yeah. It turned, look at this. Of course. Yeah, here's, here's a little staff for everybody. You know, we've been doing the show. We've had different formats. We've had uh, interviews. We did a we did a one on one interview with Walter Wong, a four part series. We've had mm. uh, a few Saab master texts for more modern Saabs on. Uh, this show got the most, the vintage Saab show with uh, I think at, we had twenty nine people at one time had the most uh, people on the show uh, of any of the shows. So I think that means we definitely have to do the vintage. Well, cool. Yeah. That's again. exciting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. Uh, maybe we'll get uh, uh, maybe Chris so, will specialize in sonnets by the summer. There is so much more with vintage <laughs> that that we only could just imagine. There's so much that people just do not, on average, know in the community unless you're in it. Yeah, yeah. Scott. Yes, Scott. This is a yes. message. For, this is Larry Jewett. It's hey, a Larry. message for Bill, Bill Flayhive. You there? Yes, I, I'm here. I need, to, I need to meet you sometime. I live up in Leeds. I've, I've chased your cars from Eastport all the way to, I believe you live in Falmouth now? Yeah, I do. You you have, huh? Yes, I spotted your cars when uh, you lived in Eastport, and I tried to connect with you there and uh, could never see you at home. Uh, and so I saw her in the magazines where you're in Falmouth. So we need to connect. Yeah, where, Who lives where in are you Falmouth? In Which car lives in Falmouth? Bill Flay, I do in Falmouth, Maine. No, not Falmouth, Fal Maine. Falmouth, oh, Maine. Okay, they've, they've opened you're the in, borders uh, just barely. Uh, <laughs> you're in you're in Leeds, um. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll 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 connect. Yeah, I had a bunch of them up in Eastport that used to put out on Fourth of July. Right. Very good. And if anybody wants to contact me, I'd be more than happy to talk to them. And my my email is Vernon Atterbury, V E R N O N, Atterbury, A T T E R B E R R Y, 53 at gmail.com. I'd be more, than you, happy, be more than happy to talk with anyone. <laughs> That's great. All right, Glenn, let's wrap it up. I want to thank everybody today. Thank you guys. I wanna, hey, Scott, this has been great. Thanks this has everyone. Been fun. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for everybody for coming. Yeah. Thanks. Big, yeah. really big thanks to you, Brad, Vernon, Greg, and Chris. Yeah. What was yeah. Chris Enjoy, enjoyed it immensely. What was Chris's up in Dorset, Vermont? What was his garage or Rizon? Go ahead, Chris. That's R I Z Z O N. Yeah. It's in Dorset. The uh, web address is rizonsawrepair.com. Okay. R I Z Z O N. 
I even have behind me, my wife let me put up in the uh, the yeah. library a vintage Rizan. cutout of yeah. a Saab two-stroke engine. So she's been with me 25 <laughs> years. I came from Europe. Rizan, Saab's repair. <laughs> yeah, so she's, my wife has dealt with it. You know, underneath the bed is <laughs> parts. I mean, you just never know when you need a Saab part. And what Doris it is. <laughs> My wife is only ever the only car, the only brand, you know, brand of car she's ever driven is Saab since she was uh, since mm. she got her permit at sixteen. Wow, that's very that's yeah. cool. It's a Saab yeah. love story. That's really it continues cool. Continues to be a Saab love story. Well, thank you, Scott. Thank you, guys. This has just been great. I'm Glenn Brooks from the Saab and Driving Show, and thank you guys for listening. And I'm I'm eager for the next one. And we got loads loads of wonderful shows coming up. Thanks everybody very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Scott. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, guys. Yep, thanks.